Thank you very much. So I'm Josh Triplett. I'm really honored to be invited to speak with you all today. So I'm talking about evolving Rust to the next 10 million developers. So first of all, what do I mean by that? Why do I say the next 10 million developers? Well, the, by at least some estimates, there were about 2.8 million Rust developers around this time last year. And compared to that, by some estimates, at least 26 million software developers in the world. So we're incredibly popular, but also have a long way to go. And of course, the number of software developers will continue to grow. And part of our goal is to make Rust for everyone, not just for a subset of developers or a subset of applications, but to help it reach everyone. So if you've been around Rust and the Rust community, or really if you've stood still next to a Rust developer for more than a few seconds, you've probably heard about the Stack Overflow survey that we always love to talk about. Rust being the most admired programming language or previously called the most loved programming language. And one fun new thing for the 2023 Stack Overflow survey is that that applies also to the Cargo tool. The Cargo package manager was the uh, most loved package manager people want to continue working with. So what exactly does that statistic mean? Because the details are important. What it says is, what fraction of people who say that they're currently using Rust also say that they want to keep using Rust in the future? So the key part of that phrase is people who are currently using Rust. Well, what about all the people who are not able to use Rust for one reason or another? Either it doesn't do what they need it to, circumstances prevent them from trying it, or very importantly, what about the people who tried to learn Rust and bounced off? Well, they're not one of the current Rust users, so as much as we like to cite that Stack Overflow statistic, we're leaving out all the people who aren't yet Rust users and who would like to be. So I want to talk about a couple of results from last year's annual Rust survey, which got summarized on a, the Rust blog a couple months ago. So first of all, it, one of the things it asked is, if you haven't learned Rust yet, what's your reason for doing so? And 26% of people said that the perception of it being difficult to learn Rust was their main reason. That's the second biggest reason. The only bigger one is, oh, I haven't had the chance yet. Understandable. So then there's also a section on the survey for, well, what about people who aren't using Rust anymore but used to? So what did they say about their experiences with Rust? Well, 30% of them say that the difficulty of working with Rust was the primary reason they left. And again, that's the second biggest category. 47% was factors outside their control, which includes things like, oh, my company doesn't use Rust anymore, or my circumstances changed. So that makes it pretty clear that difficulty of learning the language and working with the language is one of our major factors for adoption that we need to work on. So I have some good news. This was a new study just came out a couple of days ago from Google. They had a blog post talking about scaling Rust adoption. They had a new training course. And this cites some of their older material on 2022 results from learning Rust. So some of it's fairly positive. They said that two-thirds of people became confident in contributing to a Rust code base within two months of starting to learn it. That's pretty great. One third felt after two months that they were just as productive in Rust as any other language they used. And after four months, that becomes about half of people feel like, oh, I'm just as productive in Rust as whatever other language I'm used to. And they said that the ramp up numbers for this are very much in line with what they've seen for developers to adopt other languages. So their perspective was that Rust was not substantially harder to learn, just different to learn. But the biggest thing they said was the top three challenging areas of Rust to learn were macros, the ownership and borrowing system, and asynchronous Rust. So three things that we definitely want to work on. And that was a study with experienced professionals, people who had a professional need to immediately start using Rust or learning Rust, who already had a lot of experience with other programming languages. There have also been lots of attempts with people learning Rust as a first language or learning Rust as a new novice programmer. So I would definitely recommend Will Crichton's more extensive work on all of the challenges of learning Rust. He has some extensive studies on what things trip people up. But there's still this perception of difficulty. And this, some of that may be real. Some of that may be that we built up a great reputation of being incredibly hard to learn. 
Rust has gotten a lot easier to learn, and to some extent the reputation lags behind the reality where it's gotten easier and so it may just be intimidating. But one way or another, we're not grading on a curve here. We're not saying, oh, well, this is good enough. We, Rust should be easier to learn than it is, and Rust should feel easier to learn than it is. It needs to be inviting, welcoming, not intimidating. So with that, I want to ask a few questions. What changes could we make to Rust to help developers learn Rust? Will the Rust ecosystem itself scale to having five times, 10 times, 20 times as many developers in it? Will all of the processes, all of the mechanisms, all of the infrastructure we have scale to that many developers? And also, how do we avoid local maxima in language and library design? How do we avoid circumstances where we are evolving the language in a given direction? We've hit some local maximum where it's hard to do better without making a substantial change. So for that last question, I'm going to refer you forward to the talk I'm giving at the conference in three days the plans for the long future of Rust, and that'll talk a little bit more about larger, more radical changes we could consider making over the next many decades. So I wanna focus on those first two questions. What changes should we make to Rust to make it more learnable? And is the Rust infrastructure itself, the ecosystem, going to scale? So I'm gonna be talking about a number of different things today. A number of them are on the Rust language roadmap, which you can read online. So that gives much more concrete plans of specific changes we want to make to the Rust language, and other Rust teams have their own roadmaps as well. I'm also going to be doing some pretty wild speculations about the future above and beyond that. So this is a good time to give some large disclaimers about this. First of all, there is no substitute for talking to users. We make lots of conjectures about, oh, if we do this, it'll be easier to learn. If we do that, it'll be easier to learn. There is no substitute for finding out what people have trouble with making that better, and then going back and measuring to see if we actually made it easier to learn, and anything else is a poor substitute for that. So any of this conjecture definitely needs to be tested with new users before we decide that it's the plan. The goal of this is to inspire you to figure out what we could do to make Rust better, or to talk about what Rust needs, rather than to say, here's the exact plan and strategy. I'm going to be speculating pretty heavily, as I said. Uh, for any concrete details, you should see the actual roadmaps, because anything that's not on those roadmaps, you should take as especially speculative. And most importantly, no one person speaks for all of Rust. Not me, not anybody else. It's a large consensus open source project, and we're going to have to form that consensus before we make any changes. So with those disclaimers out of the way, if any of the ideas I talk about today sound exciting, we're absolutely going to need help getting there. So when you hear interesting ideas, don't take this as, oh, that's a fun thing that's already being worked on, I'll wait to see if that's done. Take that as, oh, that sounds fun, I should come help make that happen. So I said earlier, ownership and borrowing. Well, ownership and borrowing is one of the cornerstones of Rust as a language. It's one of the biggest unique features we have that other languages don't. And it empowers a lot of the strengths of Rust, its security story, its safety story, its correctness story. And as said earlier, it's one of the things people find challenging to learn, very much because it is a unique feature of Rust. So there's a great quote from Fred Brooks from The Mythical Man Month. It, the language is a little bit dated, but it's, show me your uh, software, your algorithms effectively, and conceal your data structures, and I won't have a clue what you're doing show me your data structures, and I don't need, I hardly even need to see your code, it'll be really obvious. So the point of this was that Rust really forces you to get the data structures correct. It's really difficult to write Rust and have a vague idea of what you're trying to put together and have the compiler let you get away with it. It's hard to prototype that way. You really have to get the data structures right up front before Rust will even let your code compile. And so a huge part of people learning to think in Rust is about data structure design. You learn what kinds of data structures Rust is happy with and what kinds of data structures are going to invite a lot of trouble and pain your way and that you might want to avoid unless you really have a need for them. So Rust is particularly great for writing high performance code, whether it's a high performance AI, a game engine, a high end web server or networking, low end operating system code, all sorts of things that need high performance, it can go anywhere. 
But not all code is high performance. So one takeaway that I hope you have from this is, first make your code correct, then measure it, and then if you really need to optimize it, go ahead and optimize it. Don't feel like you have to look at the pinnacle of Rust code design of perfectly borrowed, never cloned code and say, okay, I have to be as good as that from day one. I have uh, this same sticker on my laptop. Just call clone if you need to, it's really fine. Use clone, use arc, use reference counting, use RW locks, hit it with a big enough hammer to get your code compiling, and then if it turns out to be slow, then okay, fine, you can optimize it then. A lot of people have done this, a lot of people have taken this route, maybe rewriting some algorithm they designed, uh, moving something from a, an interpreted language into a compiled language, and found that it was so wildly fast already that they didn't really need it to be any faster, so they stopped there and they managed to get something done very quickly. So there's a trade-off people talk about in Rust all the time. Rust helps you take bugs that you would have seen sometime later at runtime, you would have hit an assert, a seg fault if you're very lucky, data corruption, and move that into something that the compiler says, hey, you can't do that. There's a, you know, a problem with your references, there's a problem with borrowing, I can't prove that's correct. And that's a great trade-off. Lots of people love this about Rust. They say, well, if you can make that trade-off, if you can catch your bugs earlier, why wouldn't you want to do that? Many people also find this really frustrating about Rust. And one specific reason for, like, this is when people say they're fighting the borrow checker, this is what they mean. They're trying to convince Rust that their code is correct, even though they feel like they think it is already correct. And one of the reasons people find this frustrating is that they uh, aren't making a two-off trade-off there, bugs at runtime versus bugs at compile time. It's a three-way trade-off. Bugs at runtime, bugs at compile time, and bugs that are just sitting around in the code that you haven't actually hit at all yet. But it's remarkable how often you can ship code that way, and Rust won't let you get away with that, but a lot of things will. And that sounds kind of terrible said that way, but another word for that is prototyping. You're trying to throw something together, you're trying to do some quick and dirty scripting, and when people are writing code and trying to do something quick, try something out, play around to see what happens, then they sometimes find that Rust feels a little frustrating then. Oh, I have to prove everything is correct to the compiler before I can even play with it and see what happens. This is one of Python's strengths and one of another, a bunch of other languages' strengths. Yeah, you might hit an exception at runtime, but you can also just type stuff and see what happens and see what the bug would have been and then fix it. And sometimes that's what you want. So one interesting question is, should we make prototyping easier in Rust? Should we make it easier to say, well, I can tell you that there seems to be a bug in this, or at least that I can't prove it correct, but maybe I could also show you what it would do if you did run it, walk you through it, not let you corrupt memory or similar, but catch what would have happened and say, well, here's the correct behavior if you give it the correct input, so maybe it doesn't have the right error handling. Make prototyping easier, make quick read eval print loops easier, make AI design easier, all sorts of things like that. And this is something we've traditionally been hesitant to do in Rust, but that we may want to consider doing if we want people to feel less frustrated with their initial learning. If instead of telling them, your code isn't right yet, we can tell them, your code isn't right yet, but also here's what the part you've written so far will do, that seems like an improvement. So also on that front, we're always working to improve the borrow checker. A number of years ago, there was a huge advancement called non-lexical lifetimes, or NLL, and there's a new set of work happening now called Polonius. There's actually a great blog post on the status of that that just got posted today. And a big part of this is teaching Rust to understand more kinds of code, more things you're able to do, so that you reduce the number of times you say, well, my code is correct, why can't Rust see that and just agree with me? You fight the borrow checker less because the borrow checker is smarter and it says, oh, I see what you're doing and I wouldn't have seen it before, but now I do. So we're making improvements like that and we're trying to do that while keeping the compiler still very high performance. Other things we want to improve, well, suppose you're writing a simple hash table. You're trying to get something associated with a key and you write code like this. Well, the subtle thing that's wrong with this code is that it's expecting a reference to a key because you might have a string, you might have something else that has to be borrowed. So you write this, you get an error, and you have to fix your code. But 
we really could understand what's going on here. There's really no point in borrowing a number. You could just copy it, and Rust knows that. It has a type for this called copy. So one of the things we've talked about is automatic referencing, where we don't want to make something mutably referenced by default without making that really explicit, because that can lead to some very complicated bugs. But if you're talking about a read-only reference to data that you could otherwise have copied, why don't we just do this for you instead of saying, oh, I don't understand this. Why don't you fix it to this thing that I know you meant? And then we can add lots of lints to the compiler to catch cases where, oh, I automatically referenced a thing, and then I did that again, and then I did that again, and somehow I ended up with a reference to a reference to a reference to a string, which this happens sometimes. This has been one of our reasons for being hesitant to do automatic referencing, but this is absolutely something we can catch and improve and help people with. There's some other work we can do to make temporary lifetimes better. This comes up a lot when you call things like the format args macro or other types of operations embedded in the middle of an expression. You write something that borrows an expression and it doesn't live long enough to run it over the entire uh, operation. So you have to sit, go make a temporary, borrow that, plug in the temporary, and reformat your code in a more unnatural way. We're working on ways and talking about ways to improve that by extending the lifetime automatically to say, oh, you clearly meant for that to last for this whole function call, so I'll just implicitly do that. And as long as that doesn't conflict with anything, we should be able to do that automatically and let you write the code in the most natural way and have it just work. Implied bounds are another case people have asked for often. Sometimes you'll write a data structure and you'll say, in order to have this data structure, something has to be copyable, clonable, it has to be displayable, debuggable, it has to be serializable. You give it trait bounds, and then you write a dozen functions that use that data type, and every single time, you have to write those same bounds saying, oh, well, because I'm putting it in this data structure, it has to be a thing that you can copy and clone and serialize and display, and you repeat yourself dozens of times for the same functions, and Rust could just notice that, well, rather than repeating yourself so much, you already told me what I need in order to have this data structure. If those are inherent parts of working with this data structure, I can just assume those and not require you to write them every time if you're not using them yourself. Uh, let else is something that we've recently stabilized and people seem very happy with. This is just a simple pattern to help people check something against a pattern and do an early exit if it's not uh, what you expect. This is the kind of ease of use feature that just makes code simpler to write and simpler to read. It makes the code more straightforward so that it's less to keep in your head at once. I want to take a moment and mention generic associated types and Anybody who's familiar with what those are may be going, wait, that's a new user feature? That's a usability feature? Isn't that some incredibly complicated type theory thing? Why do people care about that for usability? But it turns out that what this means is you're taking associated types, which people do use, and generics, which people use all the time, and saying, yeah, you can use those things together. It's OK. In reality, once you show people what this enables, the most common reaction has been, wait, I thought Rust already supported that. So, in a lot of ways, generic associated types are an orthogonality feature. There's something where we said, well, you can do A, you can do B, so you should be able to do A and B together. This is something we're working on a lot in Rust, of saying you shouldn't have special cases. You shouldn't have, here's this one thing you can do here, but you can't do it in this other place, even though that would make perfect sense. We're doing a lot more of that as well, like impl trait, async functions, lots of things of... If you can do it one place, you should be able to do it everywhere in the language and not have these weird arbitrary restrictions. So speaking of async, I mentioned the study earlier that that was one of the other items that people find really difficult to work with. Now, there is a degree to which async itself as a concept is just a little bit more complicated. You're dealing with an asynchronous world, things can happen multiple at a time, but that's not the main reason it's complicated. There are things like, which runtime do I use? Which libraries do I use? And having to choose among those when you might not, you might still be learning async and you're having to guess, well, which ecosystem should I go with and did I make a mistake? I've heard from a number of people and I've had this experience myself of, well, I'm hesitant to get into async because what if I make the wrong choice? I might be stuck with it for a long time. 
So we're making that better. We're trying to make it so that you don't have to care up front. You can write code that'll work with anything. We're also making it so you can use async and infiltrate anywhere, as I mentioned. So you can write a trait that involves async functions. And that's going to make it possible for us to make async read, async write, other types of basic operations like file operations standardized so that everybody can write async code around them. We're looking to add generators, uh, similar to Python generators or generators in a lot of other languages, a way of writing one function that looks like an ordinary function, but rather than returning a single value, it yields a series of values. And this makes it much, much easier to write iterators, to write async iterators, to write all sorts of code that currently requires writing a complex set of types and traits and interfaces just to make something as simple as walk along a data structure. We're making that a lot easier in the future. We're looking to make it possible for libraries themselves to help Rust users and Rust developers write better code. So one of the things people have often talked about about Rust is that they love its error messages. They love how completely Rust can say, here's exactly what went wrong with your code, here's why I think it's wrong, here's this other related part, and even here's how to fix that so that you can make it better. And we want to extend that to library authors where they know their patterns, they know their users, they know the kinds of mistakes their users commonly make. They find out every time they get a bug report and the answer to the bug report is, oh, you're not quite using it right, here's what you should be doing and we'll try to make the documentation better. Well, what if you could extend the compiler to say, oh, that's the common pattern that people keep doing and rather than just giving you a complex type error, what if you could specifically say, oh, you probably want this specific thing, go look at this piece of the documentation and fill it in this way and make this substitution in your code. We could give the power of better Rust error messages to everybody in the ecosystem. And this will help the ecosystem scale better as well. It means people aren't tempted to say, oh, I need to put that in the standard library so that it's easier to use and has better errors. We're always working to make the Rust compiler faster and this is, to some degree, an ease of use thing. People do directly talk about performance as a reason that they have difficulty with Rust, but it's also just a matter of the faster you compile, the more often you can compile, the quicker you can get feedback on your code and iterate. So we're working on lots of ways to make that better. We're working on making Rust run in parallel, compile different parts of your code in parallel. And for more on that, you should see uh, Nick Nethercoat's talk on uh, making Rust faster. So wildly speculating here, something that other languages do that Rust could learn from, the Zig language has an integrated C compiler, which is an amazing thing. You can compile Zig code and C code together with one compiler and have them transparently interoperate. We could do the same thing with Rust, teach it to be a first class C compiler, to understand how C and Rust interoperate, and this has two advantages. One is it makes it easy to call C from Rust and Rust from C. It can understand C headers and not require you to duplicate them or run bind gen or C bind gen. But another reason is just it's one less thing to set up when you're trying to get a tool chain running. It's a simple C compiler that could always be available so that you don't worry about whether you've properly installed the C compiler on Windows or the C compiler on Mac OS or the cross compiler you need for this obscure target, you just have a C compiler that always works, has enough features to get the job done, and gives you the option of uh, working with C and Rust together for its first class integration. So another thing that we're hoping to improve, I mentioned auto ref earlier, and this is a variation on that. There's two traits in Rust that people are usually learn fairly early, the copy trait and the clone trait. Copy is things that you can implicitly move from one place to another, copy from one place to another, and end up with two of them without running any code. And clone are things you have to do some amount of work to copy. And historically, copy is something that happens automatically. You can copy a type and keep the original, and you don't have to write any special code to do that. Clone, you have to call dot clone to do that. But if you look at the actual types that support copy versus the ones that support clone, this may not always be a sensible distinction. You can have a type like an array of four, uh, 4,096 elements, and that's copy. You can implicitly, without writing any code, copy a page-sized object. You could copy a megabyte-sized object, and Rust won't tell you anything about it. 
So we're hoping in the future to give some threshold warnings for, hey, maybe you don't want to implicitly copy this massive array. Maybe you want to borrow it instead. On the flip side, there are types like ARC, the uh, atomic reference counted type, that the clone operation, yeah, it has to do some work. It has to do one atomic operation to take a reference count. That is a relatively small amount of work, and we could reasonably ask, how much value are we gaining by making you type dot clone? There's a lot of trade-offs to be had here. Maybe we don't want to allow that, maybe we do, maybe we want to make that an option people can choose, but we should at least consider the possibility that with something as cheap to clone as an arc, maybe you shouldn't have to write clone every single time. We've talked about making macros better and easier. There is a, uh, a talk later in this workshop about exactly that from Vadim. We've talked about making proc macros and derives better as well. This is something where this is a great way for code to integrate between different crates. You can provide a derive for your trait so that rather than hand implementing a trait, you can derive it for your type and get an implementation automatically. But that is one of the more arcane things to write in Rust. Writing a proc macro is fairly complicated. Yeah, there are tutorials, but it ought to be easier, and maybe it shouldn't even require writing a proc macro. Maybe it should require writing an ordinary macro. So those are examples of how we can help Rust scale as well as be more learnable, and I want to give a few more of those as well. We've talked about having a capabilities system in Rust, some way to switch out pieces of the, the uh, library underneath common elements, things like an async runtime or implementations of a file system or implementations of networking. So these are things like, well, what if instead of having a normal file system implementation, I want to have one that's directly attaching to a network file system without mounting it or have a network stack that's using user space networking or tunneled networking to somewhere, but have it act as though I'm just opening a normal socket. This is something that makes it easier to scale by giving more interaction points of, well, I can hook the back end of this and change it to something else. And having a built-in feature in the language for this helps people integrate things by having an interface for them. We've talked about making cargo features more scalable as well. So one example of this is a lot of people who are working on embedded code, low-level code, using the, without using the standard library, will often also want to disable the default features of a crate. They don't want support for file systems. They don't want to depend on an operating system. They turn off those features. But this is really hard to scale because if you turn off the default features of a crate, that makes it difficult for them to take thing, give you more flexibility in the future, turn off more things, because, well, you've said I don't want any of the default features, so if they make a new thing you can turn off, you will have turned it off and your code will suddenly break. A lot of the stability guarantees of Rust go away when you do default features false. So we can make that scale better by disabling specific features and say, well, I want all the default features except this and this. And then if a crate adds new features that you can turn off, you will assume that they should be on by default and you will still have the stability of the functions you call being around. We're working to improve crates IO policies quite a bit. So this is more of a social aspect than a technical one where a lot of the policies of crates IO were written to work for a smaller community of people who many of them know each other already, who can call up the right person or send the right email if something goes wrong. And they're not necessarily policies that'll scale to tens of millions of people who aren't necessarily all uniformly trying to cooperate. So we're building policies that will work better for the next decades. We're talking about introducing namespacing of various types. There is a proposal being taken fairly seriously to let you create a single crate and then put a bunch of subcrates under that without having to pre-reserve your whole namespace in advance. We are working to enable mirroring, which I know that's a hot topic for a lot of people here, that it's not easy to get at all of the Rust resources from every country in the world. GitHub is not always easy to access. The uh, S3 mirrors that we have, or the Cloudflare mirrors, or the Fastly mirrors are not always perfectly accessible to everyone in the world equally. 
So we're right now working on infrastructure for signing and authentication so that we can do safe local mirroring in many different countries in the world, partnering with universities, working with people to help our infrastructure scale past the point where every single download comes directly from us. We're looking to add sandboxing so that there's more safety around proc macros, around the uh, build scripts, around other code that runs at compile time to make sure developers' systems don't get compromised by a package they build. So this applies to build scripts, it applies to proc macros, and it has a lot of advantages beyond just security. It helps us understand builds better, which is help, will help us rebuild faster. We're working on dynamic linking, working on ABIs. That includes both ABIs for Rust itself, which Amani will be talking about that later, and for interoperability across many languages. I'm working on a proposal called Krabby that will uh, allow you to call between C, Rust, Python, Go, and other high-level languages that uh, helps you work with types that are more fluent than just what C offers you. We're working on making it possible to implement function traits yourself. These are traits that are implemented by closures and functions, but that you currently cannot write yourself because they're only available on Nightly. And that would make it possible to make objects that you can call as if they were a function, but they keep state. You could build your own closures, build your own functors. This is going to involve making generics more extensible in ways that uh, allow you to pass a variable number of arguments to them. And that'll also make it easier to write implementations of traits for tuples. So that if you don't have to say, well, here's how it works for a one tuple, a two tuple, a three tuple, you can just say, here's how it works for tuples. One other aspect of scalability I want to talk about is many of the most popular crates in Rust, the ones that everybody integrates with, were written and popularized very early in the lifetime of Rust. And they were, like, you can look at those and say, well, clearly it's possible to build things that scale, but is it still possible today? It's really hard now to make something new that you want the whole ecosystem to integrate with and get any ecosystem-wide adoption of that. Because you have to convince every individual library to add support for what you're doing. And the one exception to this is, of course, if we add something to the standard library, people will immediately start making use of it. So when we add things like the IO safety initiative, people start using those types and traits right away. But this creates a really poor scaling incentive. It says, well, I have to get my things into the standard library because nothing else will get adoption by everybody. So one of the reasons this comes up a lot is that Rust has something called the orphan rule, which itself was made to help Rust scale, but it's a trade-off. So what this means is, if I want to implement a trait from crate A in a type for crate B, I have to be in either crate A or crate B. I can't write some other crate by a third party and provide integration between, say, a database layer and a version control system, or between a um, serialization library and an interesting data structure library. I can't provide third-party integration support. I have to convince one or the other to add support for the other one. And this is one of the reasons it's hard to make new ecosystem-wide traits is either you have to personally implement support for half the crates in the ecosystem and depend on 5,000 crates with a lot of feature flags, or you go around convincing thousands of crates to adopt your traits over everybody else's before you've really proven all the value of what you're doing. But if you can just provide integration in a third-party crate between these two things, then it's possible for the ecosystem to scale much more effectively. And there would be some challenges associated with that, but it's something that we would be able to work through. So that's a few examples of some of the things we'd like to work on in the future, some of the things that we hope to develop, whether to make Rust easier, whether to make Rust scale better, or any number of other things. If any of these things sound exciting, again, we absolutely are going to need help getting there. So don't take this as, we're doing this. Take this as, this thing might happen, it'll happen faster if you're helping. So with that, what do you think we should change to help developers learn Rust? What do you think the Rust ecosystem needs in order to scale? I'm going to be around the whole conference, eager to have many conversations on this and other topics.
And with that, I'm available on uh, social media on the Fediverse at josh at joshtriplet.org. I'm on GitHub, and I'm building a business to make builds go faster. So with that, I look forward to talking to all of you over the course of the conference. Thank you very much.